Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's my great pleasure to introduce the Professor Kimun Kim from Pohan University of Science and Technology from South Korea. Um, Professor uh, Kim got his uh, master degree from um, uh, Korean Advanced Institute of Science, and then he moved to United States, where he received his PhD from Stanford University. And after two years of a postdoc at uh, Northwestern University, he returned to South Korea. There in a postdoc, uh, he uh, established his research group, and now he is there as a distinguished professor. Um, since 2012, Professor Kim has been a director for Center of Self-Assembly and Complexity, which is part of uh, Basic Institute of Science in South Korea. Um, he received um, many awards, uh, including the prestigious Isaac Christensen Award from 2012. Uh, Professor uh, Kim Moon Kim uh, research interests are in uh, supramolecular materials and their application, and uh, I just mentioned uh, application like catalysis, uh, drug de delivery, sensing, or uh, gas storage. Um, I would like to highlight uh, his um, achievement um, uh, of discovery of uh, homochiral metal organic frameworks, uh, which been published in uh, Nature in 2000 and uh, has uh, already more than 3,600 citations. Um, but um, more related to today's lecture are cucurbiturals homologs, uh, also discovered by Professor Kim in 2000. Um, popularity of these macrocyclic molecules is due to their extraordinary binding affinities in water to many uh, guest compounds, and also for uh, the ability to be modified, and uh, Professor Kim's group play a major role in these discoveries. Um, so I'm sure we will hear much more today about these exciting molecules, but before I give the uh, floor to Professor Kim, I would like you to uh, come here and present you with the medal, uh, Mendel medal. Okay. <laughs> you didn't tell me. <laughs> wow. Boy, I love it. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Normally such um, medal and certificates are given after the lecture, but uh, you're no giving it. Yeah, but this is a good opportunity to start lecture with. Okay, <laughs> so you can Thank you very much, it. sure. <laughs> so now, please, floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much, Vladimir. So if you allow me, i just put it away for the for the time being, and um, I usually don't wear tie and suit. <laughs> it's not my style. <laughs> I'd rather take off, if you don't mind. <laughs> Nevertheless, uh, since we have a photographer, uh, I should be uh, <laughs> a little bit <laughs> take care of uh, the suit and ties and so on. Oh, bye. Yes, indeed, uh, it's a great honor and privilege to be here and deliver a Mendel Lecture on the um, special day. It's a Mendel Day? Uh, I didn't... <laughs> Vladimir, <laughs> you didn't inform me that so <laughs> before I came here, right? <laughs> so this must be the closing event of this Mendel Day, celebrating a 200... Uh, 200, is correct? Yes anniversary of Gregor Mendel's birth. Um, that's something I didn't also realize. So um, I've been enjoying this visit very much. I enjoyed it um, 
my very first visit to Bruno five years ago when uh, Vladimir organized a conference on cuckoo betrayals. And uh, I came here with my wife, and she enjoyed us here even more. So when I said, uh, I'm coming for this lecture, she said, oh, of course, I will join you. <laughs> However, unfortunately, this time she couldn't make it. Uh, we have a small house uh, in Boston. Um, although I uh, work in Korea, but uh, yes, my um, children, and they live in the United States. Uh, so my wife, uh, yes, went to the States to take care of uh, our granddaughter, but uh, she was uh, trapped due to this pandemic. And um, yeah. This time, uh, for another reason, she couldn't join me. So uh, it's rather unfortunate, but uh, I've been enjoying it, and I thank you for having me here. Of course, I should thank uh, all the people who uh, made it possible, including Krejcik, Professor Krejcik. Krejcik. <laughs> uh, although I heard that uh, he's uh, recovering from the COVID, uh, so uh, I hope I, I can meet him uh, before I leave here. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let me. Can you read these Korean <laughs> characters? I'm sure <laughs> you don't. <laughs> you don't have to. But I just want to show you that uh, Gregor Mendel is also a hero in our country. And uh, we all learn about him as well as his work at school. Even at this uh, very young age, this is a copy of this uh, middle school science textbook, and this is the uh, Mendel's biography for kids. Uh, yes. So that certainly indicates that uh, how popular he is. And when, before I came here, I told them, yes, I'm uh, coming here to deliver the Mendel lecture. Is that the same Mendel <laughs> that I know? Yes, indeed. Yes, that is. Uh, so that was fun. And in preparing my talk uh, before I came here, I chose uh, uh, this uh, cover image. And most of you understand why I chose this um, image. But of course, it symbolized our work. But it also reminded me of good old days when my wife and I followed our kids visiting our neighbors for a trick or treat on Halloween. However, we were devastated by this tragic accident happened in Seoul last weekend. Do you know about that? Yes, you all know about that. So I'd like to thank all of you um, for sharing uh, your thoughts and prayers with us in this very difficult time. So. I thought as I was wearing as a black tie, <laughs> but I, I think it's a part of a celebration, so I decided to not to take a black one. But anyway, um, coming back to science, what I'd like to do this evening, is, although it's just uh, maybe afternoon, is a new chemical tool we developed over the last 15 years, which may be useful not only in chemistry, but also other areas, such as biology, and material science and so on and so forth. Okay, so let me start with uh, this molecule. <laughs> and most of you are familiar with this molecule, but just in case, this molecule named cucurbitril, or CB6 in short, is nothing but a macrocycle made of uh, six of this unit connected to each other <clears throat> through altogether 12 methylene bridges in a cyclic manner. And notice that uh, it has a very this symmetrical structure with a cavity that can accommodate small molecules such as benzene or THF. So Vladimir kindly allowed me to borrow this, uh, his uh, model. So I'm sure as most of you have seen but uh, just in case, I will ask you to pass around. Yeah. Don't break it. <laughs> uh, 
I also brought, uh, yes, um, more robust one, this one. You cannot break it. <laughs> so please. Please have a look and pass it down. So, yes, okay. Thank you very much. I like that. That's a 3D printer made, yes, uh, models. Uh, I wish I can uh, have such a one. It's a nice one. Okay. <laughs> anyway, the, um, nevertheless, the most exciting properties of this molecule is that it binds small molecules and ions very tightly and very selectively and in aqueous solution. I don't have time to go through this, all these things, but just Notice that it can bind, yes, some molecules with a very high binding affinity, 10 to the 6. So, um, some of you may not be the chemist. Do, uh, do we have a non chemist here? Ah, okay, then. <laughs> I was a little bit concerned. <laughs> This is known as an ammonium moiety, and whenever you have uh, this moiety, it can bind quite, quite tightly. Okay. <clears throat> it's now it's more than 20 years ago, we and others discovered and successfully isolate other members of this host family, namely CB5 to CB10. And notice that so going from CB5 to CB10, ring size gets larger, so that it can accommodate even larger gas molecules inside a cavity. That's the first thing. And we also developed a very straightforward way to introduce a very reactive functional groups, which allows us to synthesize a wide variety of uh, tailor-made derivatives, so called. So, yeah, basically forget about the chemistry. Just, uh, yeah, so we can attach something and we can anchor these molecules on the surface and we can do all kinds of tricks. Of course, uh, there are analogs and congeners, or you can think of us as a cousins and second cousins of the sucrucovitrol. And that includes these bambustrels developed by this famous chemist sitting over there, <laughs> Vladimir. Okay. These functionalized sucrucovitrols allow us to explore so many, many applications. <clears throat> ranging from sensors and drug delivery, polymers, and some of these uh, bio biological applications. So today, I will briefly talk about our work in these two areas. Okay. All right. Once again, <clears throat> sorry about this chemical formula for you, but <laughs> this molecule is known as amphetamine. And it is an active ingredient of our FDA-approved prescription drug, such as Adderall, to treat ADHD. And it also makes you feel more in control and concentrate on things on better. It's quite popular among students. However, if you keep using this one, and if you use it in larger amount, it's going to be a problem. Yes, you may, uh, you may be yes, addicted, and you may have sleeping problem. You can be quite violent, even it lead to the death. Okay. And there are even more potent chemicals having a similar structure, such as meth uh, amphetamine and uh, this molecule. And they are known as uh, amphetamine type of stimulants, or ATS, and Abuse of this ATS has become a global problem, as you know. Notice that Czech, this country is not free from this problem. Okay. So, as a chemist, we must do something for the society to stop abusing this drug. And we thought so one way to do it is to develop a supportable sensor that can detect ATS very quickly, easily, and at low cost. So, 
With that goal, one of the, uh, these the team leaders of our center, Dr. Huang, decided to develop a receptor. And soon he realized that CB7 can may recognize these ATS molecules because they are all amines and they si their size quite nicely match the size of this cavity. Indeed, it forms a very stable complex with all of them. It's a one-to-one -one complex, right? as confirmed by various techniques, of course, in, including X-ray crystallography. Having seen that, we decide to go ahead and do, develop a so-called OFAT-based sensor, organic field effect transistor-based sensor, in collaboration with Professor O. Oh, at the time he was at our chemical engineering department. He moved to Seoul National University later. So first thing we did was uh, spin-coded this uh, functionalized CV7 on top of this organic layer, semiconductor layer, and made a digital device. And indeed, it can detect the ATS very low level, even the picomolar level, 10 to the minus 12s, right? even with a one drop of urine sample, and instantaneously. Right? And we've also developed a this, uh, portable sensor that can be operated by your smartphone, okay? so that uh, you can detect the ATS on site whenever you need it. Okay? And I hope uh, <laughs> this device is, is, will be available as soon as in the market. All right, so let's get to the this is real serious business now, and the main topic of the today. I will start with uh, this introduction. As you may know, streptavidin uh, biotin is um, one of the strongest non-covalent interaction pair available in nature, with a binding affinity of the 10 to the 13th and 10 to the 15th. Because of the, this uh, high affinity as well as a specificity. It has been widely used in many applications, immunoassay, bioimaging, and affinity chromatography, and so on and so forth. However, this is not a perfect system. It also suffers some demerits. Okay? That includes it is irreversible in binding. In other words, once you form a complex, it's difficult to break up. And sometimes it is very useful, but sometimes you need to break up, right? But it doesn't. So that's one problem. And it's also binding is affected by these other biomolecules, especially biotin and the genus biotin. Of course, and this is protein and therefore size is large. Sometimes you don't like to have such a large molecules. And <clears throat> I forgot to mention this one. So, chemists would like to have a synthetic analog that can have a, such a high binding affinity, and that can be that can replace this SAPT system in practical application. But it was not easy. It's a very challenging uh, issue up until 2005, because. No one succeeded in making a, such a synthetic system that can bind a substrate with a binding affinity greater than 10 to the 9th at the time. But 2009, uh, 2005, we and Lyle Isaacs group reported really high binding synthetic system that, yes, involves a CB7, having a seven glycolyl unit. And notice that, yes, uh, this ferrocene, ferrocene and adamantane and yes, the derivatives. They are good substrate, tightly bind this, this CB7 with a binding affinity greater than 10 to the 12s. So it's almost same as the stepped up in biotin systems. That is 10 to the 13s and so on. Another thing uh, you may notice is that if you have a two ammonium group that can bind this CB7 even tighter than mono, 
ammonium ion. So rough, roughly thousandfold better. Okay, it can be important later. Yeah, I will come back to that. Having seen this high affinity host guest pair, we thought so we can use this one as a non-covalent conjugation tool. In other words, using this principle, you can bring two molecules and glue them together using non-covalent interactions. Okay. So, <clears throat> at some point, we start calling it a supramolecular latch. And you can bring these two molecules to click. It has uh, many uh, interesting features. Yes, it has uh, almost the same affinity comparable to this uh, SABT system. But on top of that, this binding of pin can be tunable and it can be reversible. And it will be very important in the later biological application, but it is a bio-orthogonal, meaning that it is not interfered by this presence of any biogenic molecules. So some people call it as a non-covalent click chemistry. And I'm sure so you know that this year Nobel, uh, chemistry, Nobel Prize in Chemistry went to this uh, click chemistry, right? So some people call it as a non-covalent click since it is so clean and works in high fidelity. Anyways, over the last 15 years, uh, we've been exploring uh, various uh, applications of this supramolecular latch that includes, yes, imaging and isolation of the proteins and so on and so forth. So I will talk about uh, some of the work that we've done this all, yes, in this, uh, in this talk. So first thing we decided to demonstrate was immobilization of the protein on a cold surface. How do we do that? Well, we first prepared as a self-assembled monolayer on cold surface and anchor CB7. And we need to introduce this ferrocin ammonium ion to the protein. So analogous to this biotinylation, we call it ferrocinylation. So once you attach this ferrocin unit, then they are just the click and we can immobilize this ferrocinylated protein on the cold surface. And it can be used as a um, glucose sensor once you uh, attach this uh, uh, glucose oxidase on this uh, surface. <clears throat> so I show you just a one <laughs> example. And I show you another example, maybe related to material science. You know what's this uh, Velcro? So this work is uh, <clears throat> inspired by, the, not by nature, but the human invention. And Velcro, this hook and uh, loop fastener. Yeah, so that works re reversibly, right? So we thought that if you anchor CB7 on one surface and ferrocin on the, the other counter surface, by bringing these two surfaces together, you can Yes, make them adhere to each other. And if necessary, you can break it up, right? So that was the idea. And in fact, when we attach the CB7 on one surface and ferrocin on the other surface, they work like a charm. So even in water, these two surfaces stick together and did not separate. However, if you don't use either CB7 or the ferrocin, then immediately they will detach the separated part. It can hold up to this two kilo weight, as shown here, but you can also make it reversible simply by adding some oxidizing agent. Because once it is oxidized to this ferrocinium ion, then binding affinities drops by 100 fold or so. So it falls off. All right, so <laughs> it was a very fun to work with this molecule in that area. All right, so let's get to the, another application now. So moving into the so biological area. So as you know, this uh, imaging is a, a 
important in chemistry, maybe it's even more important in life science, and especially it's accurate and precise imaging of our proteins and interest, which can tell us where they are and what they do in a very complex cellular environment. Yes, so this is a very vital for diagnosis and treatment of disease. So, people have been using the SABT system to visualize this protein of interest. So, normally what they do is to introduce a, this a biotin, a biotin moiety as a chemical handle and visualize this biotin related protein with flow pore attached to this streptavidin unit that is shown in this slide. However, it works well. However, it has a problem. One problem is that there are always, and in some cases, lots of endogenous biotin or endogenously biotinated proteins that interfere this binding, or it keeps a false positive as illustrated by these green dots. So this unavoidable problem of this is an intrinsic problem. And of course, this uh, streptobidin is a uh, protein. Therefore, it's a very large. It's not easy, easily taken up by this, uh, this uh, live cell. So in order to do this uh, imaging, so you have to, I mean, so it, it works normally with a fixed cell, so dead cell, not live cell. So having seen this one, we immediately realized that our supramolecular latching system can, yeah, can be used in this imaging. So similar to this uh, 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 biotin lesion, we introduced uh, either ferrocin moiety or adamantane moiety as a chemical handle. And this biotin late, uh, this ferrocin laden or adamantane laden proteins can be visualized by fluorophore attached to CB7 such as a size 3 CB7. And it works quite nicely. I will show you in a minute. And uh, most importantly, it is not interfered by this presence of a biotin or any biogenic, biogenic molecule. It's orthogonal to yes, this biomaterial. So that's a, a very useful thing to know. And also, this CB is a very small compared to the streptobibin. And therefore, it can be easily taken up by the cell. And therefore, we can, yes, do the live cell imaging. And also, you can provide us a very high resolution imaging. So I will show you the, the one example. People wanted to, yes, visualize so-called plasma membrane proteins, proteins embedded in, in the outside cell membrane, right? And so what we do is that the ferrocin lates these proteins using these yes, chemicals. And these ferrocin laden pro uh, proteins can be visualized by size 3 attached CB7, as illustrated by here. So notice that these fluorescents are coming from this outside of the cell. Clearly indicates that we are staining a, this uh, plasma membrane proteins using this approach. Without telling you any details, it can be extended to any proteins in a, it's the, uh, inside a, a, a specific organelles. We can also, yes, visualize any proteins you want, yes, by introducing uh, some other labeling techniques. Okay. And it also works in even animal level, not the cell level, as illustrated by this C. elegans at the time. Okay. So, indeed, this supramolecular latching system is a very versatile and universal system for protein imaging. Okay. You may wonder, then, it works better than this uh, SABT system? Of course, it does. All right, so in order to demonstrate that, we stain a specific protein. I mean, we try to visualize in three different ways. One is 
by conventional immunostaining technique using secondary antibody, and our system, and streptobidin biotin system. First, take a look at the, this one. This one is an image by this uh, size 3 cb 7 and this one is this conventional immunostaining. And notice that they overlap, these images overlap very nicely. This nine profile shows almost a one to one matching, almost a perfect match. Whereas, if you use this one, this is a streptobidin system, then overlap is not as good as this, uh, the synthetic system. Especially, there are many false positives due to the presence of the endogenously biotinylated or biotins. So it clearly indicates that our synthetic system works better and allows us a very precise and accurate imaging of these proteins of desire. So, <clears throat> I've been talking about, yes, forming a, a very stable complex using a, this a synthetic host gas complex. And that can be useful for, yes, this uh, protein imaging. But this synthetic system does more than that, okay? That is, it can be reversible, all right? In other words, suppose it forms a complex with a ferrocene. Then you may consider this a latch-on state, right? But this latch-on system can be released by treating with a strong competitor such as this. Notice that it has a higher binding affinity, right? So once you treat that this latch-on system, then it is latch-released or latch-off. Okay. So you can recover this original component. So that can be useful in proteomics. All right. So I'm sure most of you are familiar with what the proteomics is. And we are now living in a post-genomic era. And I don't have to emphasize the importance of this proteomics in this area. You know. And this one shows this uh, typical procedure for this proteomics. After its uh, enrichment and purification, the, so use, uh, <coughs> the <coughs> from the lysate, you can isolate these proteins of that interest, which is subject to this uh, mass analysis okay, to identify these proteins. Okay, that's a typical procedure, and very rapid uh, development of uh, the tandem mass technique. Yes, they allow us to do this one, these things very easily these days. However, still, in order to get us a very reliable and accurate information from this uh, mass data, we need a clean sample. So for that, we need to, uh, yes, this, uh, enrich this, uh, the sample and make it this as, pure as, as pure as possible. However, this step is a still, there's not much improvement over the last two decades or two or three decades. So let's take a look at this one specific example. Many people are interested in so-called plasma membrane proteomics. Well, the reason is that these plasma membrane proteins are essential in many biological functions, such as this uh, extracellular communications and so on. So defining eight plasma membrane proteomes is very critical to biological study, as well as the uh, drug development, right? However, the problem is, it's not easy to isolate and identify these uh, plasma membrane proteins because they are hydrophobic. It's embedded in the lipid bilayer, so therefore it's a very hydrophobic and they are very heterogeneous. But nevertheless, SABT system also has been used for doing this job. So what they did is that attach this uh, biotin to these uh, plasma membrane proteins and follow this, uh, followed by this, this uh, lysis. This biotin laden proteins are picked up by this uh, SA attached the bead 
so capture and that can be released somehow and is subjected to the mass analysis or western blast so so that this is a typical procedure for this mem membrane protein isolation and identification however it has a problem the problem is in order to recover this protein, you have to apply the heat in case of this streptobidin. And during that process, some of the streptobidin is detached and contaminate this protein map. So that's one issue. Another more serious issue is that there are always endogenously bitinylated protein that gives a false positive. Right? So knowing these problems, we decided to use our supramolecular latching system for this uh, membrane protein isolation in co collaboration with uh, Professor Song Ho Ryu in our life science department at the time. He's retired now. So what we did was the first ferrocinlate this um, uh, membrane-bound proteins first, and after the lysis, we captured this ferrocinlate proteins, just like a uh, SABT system. However, in our case, we can recover this captured protein without applying heat, but instead by simply treating with a strong competitor. You remember latching on, latching off, right? So now we can latch off and release this ferrocinylated protein. And we can recover them intact, right? So <laughs> I don't want to spend too much time on these uh, details, but notice that this is done with uh, our synthetic system, whereas uh, this is the one with us uh, SABT system. Look at this, uh, yes, a dark spot, much darker than this one, meaning that we, we can pull off a lot more proteins by using this uh, synthetic bead. And on top of that, we, uh, our sample is not contaminated with uh, any cellular proteins or these uh, endogenously biotinylated proteins. So that's another point to make here. Of course, yes, the most nice thing about this one is that uh, by uh, treating with a strong competitor, we can recover this captured protein under very mild conditions and intact. What is the next challenge in proteomics? Well, as you know, the proteins are constantly produced, modified, and interact with the other molecules, that's other proteins, and nucleic acid, and whatever. So, <clears throat> Understanding of this is the dynamic nature of the protein is very crucial, but we need, in order to do that, we need a so-called spatial temporal analysis. In other words, we have to selectively pick up a protein at a certain site and a certain period of time. Okay. So that's, it is not trivial, all right? So, <clears throat> I will show you this one example. Do you recognize this person? His name is Sam Burns. He suffered progeria, or premature aging disease. And he died at the age of 17, unfortunately. And most, yes, pro progeria patients does not, uh, do not survive more than 20 years. Nevertheless, he said uh, he lived as a very happy life, and you can find uh, his talk at TED, TED Talks on web. Right? Perhaps some of you have seen already. Right? And it's been known that <clears throat> mutation in lamine. It's a very ubiquitous proteins located in nuclei, cause this a terrible genetic disease. And of course, uh, there are other lamin-related diseases, including a dilated 
cardiomyopathy, and so on and so forth. But still, we do not know how this causes this, this lamine related diseases, and especially how this mutation changes its interaction with the other proteins nearby. So we decide to tackle this issue <clears throat> by labeling and isolating eight proteins near the lamine. So it's getting some more serious biology, right? So sorry about that, but I thought <laughs> this is a Mendel lecture. So <laughs> I thought it would be nice to show some biological application of this, uh, our chemical tools. So without telling you too much details, we express this so-called uh, proximity labeling enzymes, such as APEX2. What it does is that the labels, whatever we, you, you provide, in this case we provide adamantane moiety, and label this adamantane moiety near the, the protein, near to this uh, lamine. And then after lysis, we can isolate, we can capture this uh, adamantane attached to proteins and they can be subjected to this um, western blood or mass analysis for sequencing and identification. Okay. We apply this method to two different types of cells. One is one having as a wild type lamine and the other is a mutant lamine. And what we found is that upon mutation, 136 proteins newly appeared, and at the same time, 14 proteins disappear. So mutation can change the, its interaction with neighboring proteins. So next thing we investigate in is how these are newly appearing and disappearing proteins are linked to each other and what they do and so on. So without telling you too much the details, there is a so-called string analysis that shows indeed these, yes, newly appearing and disappearing proteins are closely linked to each other and they, did, they do some functions such as mRNA transport, and so on and so forth. So we still do not know exactly how these proteins are involved in the salamian related diseases. But at least it provides us some clue and how this, you know, we can understand a little bit better the uh, behavior of these uh, proteins at uh, these uh, diseases on protein level. So, but still, I, I must say, this is a long way to go. So this is the slide students gave me, and <laughs> he told me, you must talk about this <laughs> to the audience. <laughs> but I'm not sure whether it's, uh, it touches your heart. <laughs> okay. So I've been trying to convince you that our synthet synthetic system is superior to the SABT system. However, <laughs> well, I'm a little bit <laughs> over-exaggerated. In fact, this uh, SABT system has been widely used in imaging and this uh, protein isolation and so on and so forth. It's a still this good way to, it's almost the only way to do these things. Okay. And it shares some common features, but Perhaps you may notice that they are also orthogonal to each other. In other words, their bindings are, do not interfere each other. All right? So SA binds only BT, and our CB7 binds only ferrocene or adamantane. It doesn't bind biotin. So what if we use both? at the same time, then maybe we can do something really unusual, all right? 
by using this, combining this natural system as well as the synthetic system. Perhaps we can discover something never seen. So with that idea, we are currently doing a trying to isolate proteins involved in some organelle communications. As you may know, there's an organelle in a cell. They communicate each other all the time to regulate a specific biological processes. And these are mainly mediated by the proteins. Okay? So identifying these proteins is very, very, very important. But so far, this is very challenging because there is only one way to isolate these proteins that is the SABT system so far. So our idea is that perhaps we can label these proteins using the two different methods. One is just a natural biotin, and the other is synthetic system, adamantane or ferrocene. And pick up these dually labeled proteins using a synthetic bead as, as well as a biological bead, natural bead. Then perhaps we can Yes, discover something new. Yes, proteins involved in organic communications. So that's the basic idea. But of course, <laughs> there are many <laughs> details which I don't want to get involved. The bottom line is, we are doing this one for the last 10 years. Trust me, when I started at my center, this is the deep, most important project we are going to do. So I'm going to put all the money here, invest the, all the people here, and still not finished yet. But we are almost there. I'm just telling you, yes, we have identified so far 21 proteins that appears to be involved in organic communication between ER and mitochondria. And some of them highlighted in the red box, they are already known to be involved in this organic communication between ER and yes, mito. That's good to know. Yes, it confirms, confirms that, yes, indeed, it works. But on top of that, we discovered the new ones now. So these are the ones we newly discovered. Okay. And <clears throat> in particular, we have just finished Yes, verification. It is indeed located between this mito and ER. So you can have a, there's a movie here. And mito is represented by this blue and this red are ER. And this yellow one, that is MSSD, MSD, we discover by these techniques. Okay. That clearly indicates that, yes, we are discovering something new now with its, by combining this natural system as well as the synthetic systems. Okay. All right, so we are now trying to uh, <laughs> validate this, uh, their functions as well by knockdown experiment and overexpress experiments, which I'm going to talk about that. So if I have another chance to come back, then I'll be happy to talk about this one. So with the, if you allow me three minutes, then um, I will talk about this, uh, one last application of our supramental latch. And <clears throat> that has to do with the purification of the protein drugs. As you know, this uh, protein drugs has, have become a, a major type of a pharmaceutical because um, it's a, some more effective and safer compared to this uh, small molecule, therapeutics. Okay. And in fact, six out of the 10 blockbuster, blockbuster drugs are protein drugs. However, there's one serious issue so from uh, yes, a patient point of view, is that it's quite expensive. So this uh, Herceptin, on a mo uh, monoclonal antibody-based uh, uh, protein drug for breast cancer, cost about 1600 US dollars for just a single injection. And patients usually take multiple injections, typically once a week, for a week, uh, for a year to cure this cancer. 
then why is this so expensive? Well, the reason is that <clears throat> it has to be purified by its multiple steps, especially this um, affinity chromatography process using so-called protein A that's supposed to specifically bind this monoclonal, monoclonal antibody. However, <clears throat> not only is it not only is it very expensive itself, the specificity is not so great. So you have to do it multiple times, and you have to do these other yes, chromatography techniques to purify this yes, monoclonal antibody-based drugs. So the question is then, is there any alternative? People have been looking for an alternative, but without much success. And we think it's that our supramolecular latch may be an alternative, may be a solution. Okay. All right. So I will tell you so what we do, what we did. We, yes, start with a genetically engineered uh, cells that can produce this monoclonal antibody-based drug, in this particular case, a septin. And it has some handle. We want to attach this uh, adamantine handle using a sort of, uh, enzymes known as a sortase. And of course, once it's attached to the chemical handle, that can be picked up by this CB7 bead and recovered by treating with a strong gas. I've been already talking about this one. Yes. One nice thing about this one is that we can recycle this uh, used bead simply by treating with a Yes, a brine solution. How does it work? Well, it simply is, I'm summarizing that, it's fun. Our bead is, at the time as we published this result, 2.5 fold better in terms of this number, uh, this, uh, the amount of the proteins that we recover compared to this uh, protein A bead. But now, Yes, so we improved this our bead, and it's now tenfold better than the proteinase. On top of that, our bead can be recycled, and even after this three cycle, this efficiency doesn't drop much. Okay, so that's a really nice thing about it. I guess it's time to close my talk, and today I'm trying to show you. It's a new chemical tool that can be useful in chemistry as well as other areas, especially as I'm emphasizing this biological area in the light of this Mendel lecture. So hopefully, yes, yeah, so this supramolecular latch can help us not only unravel this mystery of this nature, but also develop new materials and tools for diagnosis, as well as the treatment of this uh, the diseases, ultimately leading us, leading to this, uh, contributing to this uh, well-being of a human mankind. So, with that, I'd like to thank all the people who were involved in this work. I didn't do <laughs> any work, and all this recent biological work was uh, orchestrated by this. Uh, our team leader, Kyungmin Park, he's now started his own uh, academic career at this university. And I'd like to thank, yes, uh, uh, IBS for providing uh, money. And without the help of this collaborator, I, we were not able to do this, uh, yes, this job. Yes, so this slide shows us where I'm from. <laughs> we start with, uh, yes, uh, uh, okay. So this is uh, basically our campus and showing a synchrotron facility. <laughs> All right, so it's a zoom in this area. And uh, once again, uh, we have a synchrotron facility and this is a uh, fourth generation free electron laser system on our campus. Okay. And there are <laughs> other <laughs> tourist attractions nearby, including a, it's a temple established in the seventh century. So just like uh, this abbey, yes, yeah, so we have a, 
quite a nice thing to <laughs> look at. So please come and visit us. And once again, thank you for the invitation and thank you for your kind of attention. Thank you, Professor Kim, for a very nice lecture, inspiring. <laughs> One can see how you can get from rather simple molecule to very complicated uh, things. So, yeah, I'm sure there will, there will be a question, so please. Um, maybe I will start before sure. people will um, figure out the question. So, maybe you are you are showing up the application and always, I've, if I'm not mistaken, most of these applications uh, used uh, monofunctionalized cucurbit 7 urea, right? Right, that's right. So, uh, can you comment on how easy it is to functionalize and in, in how much amount you can, <laughs> you can get, actually? <laughs> that's a very tough question. <laughs> Yes, uh, <laughs> you are asking uh, synthetic details, and I uh, didn't touch that um, at all. Um, yes, the, uh, it's somewhat tricky in early days, but I think it's less tricky these days. And if you follow the protocol we published uh, in uh, several places, then, uh, yes, uh, it's a lot more reproducible. And as you said, uh, earlier we functionalized, we attached this uh, reactive functional group as, as almost randomly, but uh, we managed to put just a one hydroxy group. And once you do that, then the following transformation is now much more uh, straightforward. Using a Ritter reaction, we published in uh, Jacks a few years ago. So, if you want to follow this, uh, some of the synthesis, yes, please contact me. I can provide uh, some uh, details, all right? Yeah, I'm happy to provide you. So, are we talking about milli uh, micrograms, milligrams, or grams? Ah, still, yes. Uh, we are uh, producing a, some milligram scale. <laughs> Yes, not the gram scale yet. So that is uh, also a problem, but um, especially we want we to uh, increase the size, the scale of this um, these, uh, protein drug uh, purification. Mm -hmm. um, we've been talking uh, with uh, Venture Capital, and they are interested in commercializing this process. And they are asking a sort of pilot plant <laughs> scale. <laughs> that is too much for us. So, yes, yeah, so we are slowly yes, increasing the scale. But so far, for that, it's a, a gram scale. Okay, thank you. Hmm. So, is there any question, please? <laughs> It seems like your new latching system is very promising, yes. but are there any like, major disadvantages to the classical systems? Could you uh, repeat it as a question? Uh, do you see any major disadvantages in your latching system to oh, the classical okay. system? Okay. Um, at the moment, I don't see any. <laughs> 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 Except that uh, you have to make it. <laughs> this uh, SAVT system is uh, commercially available. So we are trying to m make it, yes, commercially available. So, so I'm going to retire in two years. So before I retire, yes, I'm trying hard to make it commercially available so that uh, biologists can use uh, this one. As a spy. Biologists uh, don't care, the synthesis, right? Uh, so that's uh, probably the uh, most serious disadvantage at the moment. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You have a question? Yeah, I saw. <laughs> uh, thank you for your talk. It's very exciting research. Um, 
I have a question about the latching off process. Sure. Uh, both guest and competitor uh, bind with uh, huge uh, association constants. Mm -hmm. What is the kinetics of the replacement? You are absolutely right. Okay. So, wow. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> we have to worry about not only some dynamics, but uh, kinetics. So it can be slow, but um, surprisingly, if you use this uh, strong competitor, it can be, yes, uh, latch off. Yes, a reasonably reasonable period of time. Okay. So uh, we were also worried about that. Yes, since the kinetics may be slow. But uh, in the, of course, uh, without a competitor, this uh, dissociation is just very, very slow. It's, it takes a few minutes. But in the presence of the strong one, yes, it takes a few minutes. And have, have you been able to measure the kinetics? No. <laughs> I, yes, uh, when I started this, our center, uh, I hired one specialist uh, and to investigate that. But unfortunately, um, he left, yes, uh, without finishing this job. If you are interested, then <laughs> we'll be happy to collaborate. <laughs> I'm not sure about that. Thank you very much. Okay. All right, is there any... Other question? Okay. Wow. Um, okay, so you are talking about possible therapeutic use of your molecule, and I'm interested in the cost reduce it would provide if it was to replace the protein A. Okay. <clears throat> That's also a very tough question, but a good question. Uh, we also, we were asked, by this uh, venture capital, exactly how much cost can you reduce? Of course, it depends on the scale, right? This protein A has been used for this uh, real production. In our case, we've, we've been running this one as a very small scale. So there's no comparison, and um, some of this cost uh, is kept secret. So uh, at the moment, I don't have any good answer for that. But yes, considering this, um, all the process involved in protein A purification and our system, our system should be, uh, should be, yes, it's much better in terms of uh, cost. So that's what I can say at the moment. Sorry. And as to the synthesis? Say? Uh, as to the synthesis part. Synthesis part. Yeah, because like the purification is one part of the cost, but also the synthesis of the molecule must uh, be considered, no? Well, this, uh, uh, of course, uh, I'm considering this, this uh, the cost of the CBs and the functional radiation and so on and so forth. But um, uh, <clears throat> based on the cost we produce those things, we all consider that. And the one reviewer asked, yes, the, we have now additional process this, in order to attach this adamantane. We use the sortase A. So having a, this uh, extra enzyme process, that may cost something. And have you considered that? So that <laughs> um, was uh, rather difficult. But efficiency-wise, it's a sortase A process. It's a highly efficient we found that. So uh, still, once again, it's uh, difficult to compare uh, directly in the same scale. Mm -hmm. So I cannot answer your question, but uh, even yes, roughly considering those all the costs, I think we have some advantage. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a question regarding the surface layer modifications. Uh, what kind of materials were modified this way, or you suppose can be modified in the future? Surface modification, you're talking about the Velcro or the uh, anchoring uh, the biomolecule on the surface? Uh, 
uh, the two-layer uh, connection. So Velcro? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so the question was? What kind of materials uh, have materials. you modified? It works um, all the materials. Just uh, to demonstrate the principle, we use this uh, one silicon surface, and the other was a glass. So we attach this, uh, I think, CIP7 on the uh, silicon, and, but it wor should work as long as uh, you have a flat surface. You have a rough surface, then it's uh, difficult to know is, uh, which one is, uh, is responsible for this uh, higher affinity. So we decide to use a very flat surface, clean surface. Okay. What is your extraction method to show that it's that you can have multiple reuses, and how are you able to determine that? Okay, so it looks like you're talking about this one. Yes. Like okay. How are you able to? That's see uh, gel uh, electrophoresis to show this the amount of captured proteins or recovered proteins. Yes. Um, so it simply illustrate that it efficiency doesn't decrease much even after this we recycle the bead. Mm -hmm. So after, protein A case also it can be in principle can be recycled but uh, I heard that it you cannot recycle forever, of course, maybe twice. But in our case, up to four, four times, after capturing, uh, we, uh, we treat it with a strong competitor, and we wanna eliminate that again to recycle, right? Uh -huh. In that case, we <laughs> one trick we found is that simply treating with a brine solution, an ACL solution, we can recover, regenerate this bead. And that seemed to work even after forced use. Sorry, you said it was a sodium chloride solution? That's right. So, oh, okay. Yes, All very right. simple. <laughs> we were also surprised. Okay, cool. Thank you. So, it doesn't seem to be any more questions. So please join me to thank the Professor Kim Kim again.